So uh, just a point of personal privilege, John Southers is a good friend of mine. We served as DAs together, and I, I think that John is the only person in the history of Colorado who served as a district attorney. He served in the 4th Judicial District, which is El Paso and uh, Teller counties. But then he also served as the United States Attorney and as the Attorney General. So really in local, state, and federal offices that are about law enforcement and nobody else in our history has ever had all the privilege really of serving in those three, those three places. John, I know you've only had a couple hours, but this isn't the first time you've thought about this or talked about it, and certainly not the first time we have. Would you sort of share from a law enforcement perspective how you view the immigration system and you know the need to fix it and even the parts that you might or might not like about the conversation in Washington DC regarding the fix? You bet, Bill. I see several law enforcement people here, and I don't pretend to speak for them all. Uh, but I have had a great deal of uh, law enforcement experience on the local, state, and federal level. And I've come to the conclusion that from a law enforcement perspective, our current immigration system really is broken. I think where it really struck me is when I was the United States Attorney. Uh, one of the priorities of the United States Attorney's offices throughout the country are prosecute something called re -ag uh, aggravated reentry. These are individuals that have been in the country illegally, have committed a serious crime, have either served time, been placed on probation, or have fled, uh, gone uh, back to their country, have then reentered the United States, and merely by reentering the United States after having been convicted of a serious crime here, you are committing another serious felony. I think the it's a, a minimum five years. Right. Um, and that's a, a priority prosecution uh, for the U.S. attorneys. So here we had a situation in Colorado. I noticed virtually everybody that was arrested for aggravated reentry, the only time we figured out that they were in the country is when they committed another crime. There may have been isolated situations where someone was just picked up on a you know, a speeding ticket or something, but almost uniformly, they had committed another relatively serious crime. Well, here's why that was the reality. At that time, and I was the U.S. Attorney from uh, uh, 2001 to 2005, uh, we estimated we had about 200,000 to 225,000 undocumented aliens come into Colorado, primarily for seasonal work uh, every year. It's probably a smaller number now. Um, Folks, 90% of these people uh, were no kind of public safety threat whatsoever. They were working in the seasonal job, sending money back to typically Mexico, uh, were oftentimes leaving after the seasonal employment. Uh, but they were undocumented. And the fact of the matter is, uh, law enforcement had very little capability of figuring out from a law enforcement perspective who the good guys were and who the bad guys were. Uh, and the problem was this dysfunctional worker permit, worker visa system. We have so few legitimate permits available uh, that have no re relationship to actual economic supply and demand uh, that we had literally 200,000 people coming in doing this work that were undocumented. If we had sufficient um, document, you know, documented, uh, or a process of documentation so that we knew who these people were, it'd be a heck of a lot easier to filter out the people that aren't supposed to be here. Uh, and so it's, it's really a, a highly dysfunctional system uh, related primarily to that. Then you've got the, all the exploitation that takes place of immigrants because they have to uh, uh, operate in the shadows. My office has prosecuted on a couple of occasions uh, people that uh, set themselves up as what are called notarios. And they lead uh, the immigrants to believe that they are immigration lawyers or whatever they're not. Uh, and they take fees up front from them in exchange for helping them with their immigration status. In fact, they're just ripoff artists. And we've prosecuted two uh, such organizations that had collected over two and a half million dollars apiece from immigrants. Uh, in my opinion, as I've closely examined the problem of human trafficking for both labor uh, exploitation and sexual exploitation, I think our current system 
uh, exacerbates our ability to deal uh, with human trafficking, once again, largely because the victims, and a lot of the victims, are undocumented uh, immigrants, uh, have no incentive to come forward, uh, and uh, we basically have to stumble across this from a, a law enforcement perspective before we're able to do anything about it. Um, so, you know, I'm a conservative Republican, and I could argue to you uh, why uh, having people who are in the country, having come here illegally, uh, should not be rewarded with citizenship, and we can accomplish the same thing by giving them leg a legal status and let their children and grandchildren become citizens. Uh, but from a law enforcement perspective, uh, there's no question, and I think most of the cops here would agree with me, this system is very broken. So, John, one of the things that you and I have talked about before is how also in law enforcement, uh, people who are here in an unauthorized fashion or illegal fashion don't report crimes. Even when they're the victims of crimes, they don't report them and how that's disturbing to a uh, district attorney or a chief of police. Uh, very much so. Um, whether it's uh, they're victims of human trafficking, whether they're victims of these uh, fraudulent immigration uh, services, uh, whether they're simply uh, victims of other kinds of uh, consumer fraud. And I'll tell you quite frankly, it is often type, uh, the, the case that immigrants are exploiting immigrants. Uh, but because uh, of the fear uh, that reporting this sort of conduct will result in their deportation, uh, there's unbelievable underreporting of this kind of uh, conduct uh, to the detriment of law enforcement. So again, we lost uh, Congressman Dreyer, and I think he would have had a different viewpoint than any of the panelists. I'm just gonna play a little bit of devil's advocate. One of the things that they say, Senator, is just do border security and in, they call it interior enforcement. So enforcement inside the country, workplace, you know, e-verify, use you know, electronic verification, just do that first. Right. Don't do the comprehensive stuff that the Senate's tried to do. Get this other stuff out of the way, and once you do that, then we're willing to talk about whether it should be a guest worker visa program or a pathway to citizenship. What's your response to that? Well, so one, one thing I want to do is be precise about this, about who the they is. Because I think there are House Republicans that actually want to pass immigration reform, want to include a pathway to citizenship. The set of principles that you read off are entirely consistent with the Senate bill, I, my view. And for whatever it's worth, I think John Boehner would really like to get this done. But I do think he's got, and Paul Ryan would like to get this done. They have a group of others that are, that are having a harder time with it. Here's my answer to them. First of all, um, remember that uh, we had not just Republicans on our gang of eight, but two from a border state, John McCain and Jeff Flake. And I can assure you that the number one issue for them and their constituents is border security. For them, it's a daily issue. I mean, John McCain can give you a very moving speech about what's happening to people that come across the border illegally that are found dead in the desert in Arizona, and I've heard him give that speech. He took us down for a tour, by the way, of the border. We flew, flew down there in helicopters to, to look at it. And if anybody wants to know why you can't build a fence across the entire thing, I'm glad to share my pictures from that trip. Um, uh, but those two guys had to assure themselves that we were good on border security in the bill. And we included in the Gang of Eight bill $8 billion of border security and a requirement that before anybody could get uh, a green card in the United States who's here undocumented, anybody could get a green card, that some of the following things had to happen. 700 m uh, more miles of fence had to be built as part of this. Uh, well, actually, I'm skipping ahead, sorry, let me just back up. So that was ours, $8 billion. By the time we got it off the floor of the Senate, the, the budget for border security in the bill was $46 billion. That was the price of admission for, to get some more people on this. It's the reason why we got almost 70 votes in the Senate. And a requirement before anybody gets uh, uh, a green card that we build 700 more miles of fence, that we hire 20,000 more border security people, that the E-Verify system is up and working so that our internal security is taken care of. They, this principle, this first principle from the House about comes out of our bill. I mean, that's what we say in the bill. 
Now, I happen to think I would love it if what the House were focused on was, hey, maybe we don't need to spend all that money on border security, because maybe having a border agent every 1,000 feet might be more than we need, but what we really need are ports of entry between the United States and Mexico that actually work really well. What we really need are customs agents on the border to move folks back and forth in commerce so that we don't lose the $6 billion a year that's estimated that we're losing because of the way the border is set up. But the politics of the moment are that we're not going to get the opportunity to do that, I don't think, right now. So I would say that I have no pride of authorship over the, these parts of what we did. And if there are better suggestions for making it more efficient, and frankly, doing it in a more fiscally responsible way, um, uh, I would be all for that. Um, the, the, and I'll stop here. The, the, the challenge is that Americans and Coloradans see all these things as normative goods. They see securing the border as a good, they see the pathway to citizenship as a good. I'm not making this up. I mean, the polling in Colorado among Republicans shows a majority of Republicans support a pathway to citizenship, and that's true across the country. In Washington, in the blood sport of the politics of Washington, D.C., which is the opposite of the way the Gang of Eight approached these issues, uh, what people say is, well, I'm not going to give you borders, I'm not going to give you citizenship until you assure me that every single, you know, uh, inch of the border is secure. I'm not going to give you uh, high-tech visas until you give me these ag visas. As we're hearing up here, look, we're competing against Canada. They're going to have 450,000 students that they're going to get into their higher education system, and they're going to keep, keep in Canada. And in the meantime, we're educating people here, and then we're saying to them, even though we subsidize their education, please go back to India and China as fast as you can to compete against the United States of America. That's the message we're sending today. If we pass this bill, we lift those caps. In fact, those students are no longer subject to the caps. And if you graduate with a STEM degree, broadly understood, uh, uh, from an American college and you've got a job offer, we'll staple a green card to your diploma. And if we're not going to be willing to do that, then what we're saying is Canada, please outcompete us. China, India, please outcompete us. Mexico, outcompete us. Do you, yeah, I'm going to come to you, Linda, but I just want to ask you if you recognize that every time you answer a question up here, the whole stage moves. I'm, I'm wondering sorry, if that I'm happens gonna... in the United <laughs> States Senate. So, so Linda, the, you know, the president talked about this in his State of the Union, said get it done. And um, Michael touched on this, but I'd like you to talk about the political appetite, not among politicians, but among the public. What do Democrats think about this? What about Republicans? And really, the Latino population as, you know, as a population, not that they all think alike, but how important is that to this issue as a political issue for Republicans? Well, I'm happy to talk about that. And in fact, the public opinion poll, and it doesn't matter who's doing the poll, uh, from Fox News to, you know, to the Washington Post to the Pew Hispanic Center, no matter what poll numbers you look at, a majority, a large majority of Americans want immigration reform. They want to see our laws fixed. Everybody recognizes the system is broken. Uh, the most polls, most recent polls show that about two-thirds of Americans want to see a change in immigration, uh, in our immigration laws, and want to give legal status to people who are already here legally. The question on citizenship is, uh, is a contention uh, among some conservatives uh, uh, who don't want to see what they would say people rewarded for having broken the law. The Hispanic population really doesn't differ very much in terms of their overall views on immigration and immigration policy and how to fix it from the American population in general. Again, if you look at the polls, uh, they're roughly the same. And by the way, immigration does not rank as one of the top three or even the top five in most polls uh, issues of importance to Hispanics when it comes to voting. But that's a little deceptive because, in fact, um, it may not be one of the top voting issues. They may think national security and, you know, education and economic uh, good economy is, is more important uh, than immigration. But it does touch an emotional chord uh, in the Hispanic community, and it's important to understand why. There are 52 million Hispanics in the United States. One out of every four of those Hispanics know someone who has been deported. 
So that's a huge number of people. Almost uh, 20 million of those Hispanics lived, live in what are called mixed status household. In other words, some members in the households are legal. They may have been born here, they're US citizens, or they came here legally, but someone else is not. So for that population, this is a very scary emotional issue. And when you have one party, and I regret to say that it is a party that I'm a proud member of, the Republican Party, talking in terms, as uh, Governor Romney did last time around, about things like self-deportation, it scares people. You're talking about somebody's grandmother, somebody's cousin, somebody's brother, somebody's child. Uh, and therefore, you're going to have a very, very emotional response. But I would like to go back just a minute to what we said about border security, because I think this is a very important point. I worked for Ronald Reagan. Uh, he is my hero. He is the man who made me a Republican. I had been a Democrat until uh, Ronald Reagan was elected. Ronald Reagan has got to be turning over in his grave now, hearing some of the talk on immigration. Not least because, you know, Ronald Reagan was for small government. He did not believe that the way you solved a problem was to throw money at it. And yet, when you hear some conservatives today talk about the border control issue, it's all about let's pour more money on it. Let's make sure we've got, you know, more uh, of a federal bureaucracy. Let's hire more people to work for the federal government. Let's turn every employer in America, including anybody out there who wants to get their lawn mowed or their child taken care of into an adjunct of the Immigration and Naturalization Service and make them check legal documents. This is not a conservative position. And secondly, I'd like to say that on the issue of the fence and the idea of 700 more miles of fence, fences do two things. They do keep people out. They also keep people in. You know, you talk, John, about the trying of uh, migration that used to take place when we had many people coming here illegally, working seasonally, and then going back home to Mexico or wherever. Uh, that was because they had some assurance that they'd be able to get back across next year when those jobs came available again uh, and it was time to pick crops. They can't do that anymore in part because, so they're stuck here. And they're stuck here in an economy that isn't providing jobs. And so we've actually created, I think, more of a problem by keeping people stuck on this side of the border who in past times would have crossed back over uh, and again, there's only one way to fix it, and it isn't through building more fences, putting more barbed wire. You can't even do what the one candidate in, in my party said last time, which was to station people with uh, guns to shoot people trying to come across uh, the border. That's not going to solve it. The only thing that's going to solve it is to move to a system like the one Marcy talked about that is economically based, market based, flexible and it gives people a legal way to come here. So, in the last census in Colorado, it's an election year, but in 2010, the Hispanic population was over 20% for the first time, and the performance of the polls was a little over 14% for the first time. So that's a really important vote, and like we said, they don't all vote, uh, Hispanics don't all vote and monolithically, but uh, it is this important block. Um, John, if you were talking to a candidate in Colorado, running for a statewide office or for a congressional office. There's some of them in the audience. Uh, well, <laughs> if you were talking to them, um, and you can, you can say your piece now, how would you talk to them about trying to work this out in Washington, D.C.? Because it really has to be, it has to be done in D.C. Yeah, by the way, we've had a little bit of discussion, federal versus state issue. Uh, folks, uh, Article One, Section 8 of the United States Constitution enumerates all the uh, powers that the federal government has. And I, for one, have sued the federal government multiple times saying you didn't have that power. Uh, but uh, trust me, that's the one power they do have. Uh, immigration and naturalization is given to the federal government. And that was the essence of some of the decisions that have come out in the last couple of years. States can do things that are complementary, but they can't do things that are uh, contradictory uh, to what the, the federal government uh, is doing. My advice to Republicans is to talk about this in a rational sort of way. There's a, there's a real uh, temptation 
uh, you know, uh, this is a party that's got Tom Tancredo back in it, uh, running for uh, governor, uh, and yet it's got uh, some very uh, thoughtful people on immigration uh, in the uh, <laughs> Gang of Eight and stuff like that. So I like to think of it as a big tent. Um, it's just kind of a, a crazy tent, that's all. Uh, but if you're going to uh, not just, uh, I, I give this speech every day, you cannot, whether you're Democrat or Republican, you cannot get elected in this state unless you get a majority of the unaffiliated votes. And uh, you've got to talk to people uh, in a way that's not going to come with these 30-second sound bites that's going to take care of your caucus constituency. You know, my big gripe about how we were organized in Colorado is our caucus system drives politics to the extreme because you're not going to win an election unless you get the nomination. If you go to a convention, I think even the Democrats will admit, although I think Republicans have been victimized by the system more than Democrats, you, say, you guys seem to coalesce better after the fact. I managed to yeah, but, but the fact of the matter is our, our caucus system and convention system drives people to the extremes. Let me give you an example, a perfect example of this. In the last election, 2% of the people in Colorado supported Ron Paul. Guess how, what percentage of the delegates to the Republican state convention supported Ron Paul? 40%. That's a system that gives undue influence uh, to radical voices. Uh, but I just tell Republicans... Uh, folks, focus on winning a general election. Uh, yeah, you got to get enough votes to get through the primary process, but you're not going to win uh, a general election in this state with the type of rhetoric uh, that's going to turn off uh, a lot of unaffiliated voters, including Hispanic voters, 20% of the vote. You're going to have to get a decent percentage of the Hispanic voters in Colorado to get elected to statewide office. So Marcy, we're going to shift gears a little bit because we're at a cell event. It really is about educating people about terrorism and how to prevent terrorism. And so um, from the perspective of national security, how important is immigration, immigration policy in Canada, and how important do you see it to the United States? In, uh, sorry, I didn't hear National that security. National security. Yeah, protecting your borders, not just from, right. you know, people coming across who might, you know, go to your schools or use your health care system, but really right. who intend to do harm to your populace. Right. Well, I just want to make a couple of comments just uh, on the securing the border, and I don't know if that's going to be helpful, but it's probably not going to be helpful, but I just thought I'd mention anyhow. Uh, so U.S.-Mexico border, 1,900 miles long. They want to build a fence, 700 miles plus whatever, I don't know. Canada-U.S. border, 5,524 miles, 117 land border crossings. We are, we are never building a fence. Don't ask us. It's not going to happen. But there's other things that you can do to secure the border. It doesn't have to be a fence, and it doesn't have to be hardwired. And some of these things are about addressing threats early, so making sure that people are traveling on trusted traveler programs, making sure that your law enforcement are talking to one another just the way that Canada has with the United States, uh, making sure that DHS knows who's coming, who's going, um, electronic travel authority, um, and, imp and uh, also, um, uh, the other thing that's really interesting, and this is something that we're doing at the Detroit-Windsor Crossing, is these public-private partnerships. So maybe there does have to be some expense made at the border, and it is going to be construction. So we've struck a deal with um, the United States where we're going to build the bridge because the trade between Canada and U.S. at the Detroit-Windsor Crossing is so important to us that we're going to build the bridge, $2.1 billion. You just need to come up with like $250,000 for the... Michigan Customs Plaza, and maybe uh, some other company will help us to privately run it and get the money back, and that's the way that we're going to have that crossing. So there's different models, I guess, for securing the border, and there's different models for constructing things at the border. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, the other thing in terms of the threats uh, to the border, well, first of all, terrorism, obviously, a big threat. Terrorism is a domestic issue, as I, we learned at the cell today. We did the tour, and we know these things are homegrown. These things happen in countries around the world. And, and so, you know, these are things that we are really con concerned about. And we're also concerned about these sort of individuals, these lone wolves who become really self-radicalized or very hard to detect. And these are the kind of things that we're looking at at the border. The other thing is transnational crime, so illicit criminal activity, guns, drugs, people smuggling. 
Uh, this is the stuff we're doing. And in that regard, we've created this national counterterrorism strategy in Canada, and this is part of our Beyond the Border uh, sharing with the United States. And in, in that regard, also with securing the perimeter, another asset that we have here in Colorado that we all share is NORAD. So NORTHCOM, we have 140 Canadian troops at NORAD, and that's how our airspace um, gets protected. So those are the kind of things that we're concerned about at the border, just as the United States is concerned about. It's not the same kind of issues at the southern border. John, you want to hop in? Yeah, I think that's important. Uh, there are some commonalities between the northern border issues and the southern border issues, but there's some dramatic differences. Right. Uh, the cartels, uh, their supply chain comes Central America, Mexico, and into our, our country. Uh, and Michael, um, all, you know, I don't know what billions it takes. Uh, 46 sounds a little outrageous to me. Uh, but we do need to stay absolutely on top of the technology it, need, it takes right. to make the border as secure as possible, not only uh, for uh, humans crossing the border, but this uh, incredible uh, flow of drugs that come into this country. And you might say, well, you can't stop it. Uh, you can do a lot better job than we're doing. I, I just want to emphasize to you that uh, the cartels are incredibly flexible uh, and malleable in terms of how they respond to changes in law enforcement in the United States. And we've got to stay on top of that. Let me just give you an example right here in Denver. We've got a meth problem in Colorado, and we've got a very serious growing uh, heroin problem. Uh, if you haven't noticed, it's nationwide. Uh, lots of people dying of heroin overdoses. It appears to be related to our prescription uh, drug abuse problems as people's supply of prescription opioids is interrupted or becomes too expensive, people are turning to street heroin. And it's just a huge boon uh, to the, uh, the Mexican cartels. But to show you how flexible they are, uh, they used to bring meth into the Denver metro area in crystallized form, already uh, crystallized. As we got more sophisticated in detecting that at the border, uh, they uh, changed to liquid meth. And believe it or not, uh, we have determined that they have a factory in Mexico that uh, bottles sports drinks. And apparently they've got a connection with a cartel because they're now bottling uh, methamphetamine uh, that's colored to look like uh, sports drinks, bringing it in the United States in great quantities. Uh, and uh, we had a very large bust in the, uh, the uh, Denver area. Uh, that's, folks, that's not going to stop. Uh, I'd like to think that our appetite for drugs in the United States would uh, wane. I don't think it's going to, and I think we still do have to do what we can uh, to keep uh, drugs uh, from coming in through Mexico and Central America, and that's going to take ever-constant changing technology uh, and sophistication that is going to cost some money. There's no question. You've been in the law enforcement business a long time. Do you think but that's possible. That certainly is the aspiration. You can see it in both the Senate and the House versions, that there would be the kind of border security that could stop or st stimulate the flow. I, I'm not naive, Bill. Uh, we're not going to cut it off. Uh, but there's a lot we can do uh, to, stem, uh, to stem it. We can get very sophisticated about mo money laundering. If you uh, cut off the money supplies, uh, it's a whole different ballgame for them. We can do a better job than we're doing. 